just yeah maybe you have seen uh, the, the the api competition this uh, at noon so that microsoft uh, gently uh, sponsored many many apis but now we will see how uh, big companies like microsoft is uh, uh, thinking apis uh, at, the, at, the, at the bigger level so please welcome jacob from microsoft and he will tell you more about it. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Mehdi, and thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. So I'll try to give you a perspective on a few things we're doing on APIs uh, at Microsoft as an example. We are, we're doing many things, so it's a quick overview of just a few topics that we're working on, um, and I hope you'll be interested in it. Um, I'll be talking about a few things. I'll be talking about what we're doing in terms of APIs on top of what we call data centers, which is a slightly broader area than what we did historically. And then some of the newer things we're doing in terms of building APIs on top of information and knowledge in a slightly more expanded way. Just for, for the sake of history, we, we've been doing APIs for quite a long time. Well, actually, to a large extent, we built a business on APIs since we started. Um, but it's not something we've stopped doing either. APIs has been a way historically for Microsoft to expose features in our software, but also to build a kind of commonality across other areas, which is the role of our OS as a platform. So building commonality on top of networks, protocols, hardware, devices, sort of the historical activity of APIs has been an example of giving an API access to a printer, whatever the printer be, and which has helped to a large extent, the development of our activity and the industry as such. We, we still do that, actually, and one example we just released recently is integrating a 3D printing API in the latest version of Windows, which basically enables you to develop any kind of 3D application and to connect it to any kind of 3D printer, which we hope should accelerate the development of the 3D printing industry. And so we look forward to doing that a lot. However, things have changed quite a lot, both in the industry and for, for Microsoft as a company, as we've been moving basically from selling boxes of software to delivering devices on one side and then what we'd call services in the cloud on the other side. And the way we approach APIs has of course changed as our business has changed. And we are now working on developing, delivering, publishing APIs that fit with this new kind of activity. And it changes quite a lot from, from a time where we basically exposed features and interfaces to other things. We're now exposing APIs on things that are a lot bigger and larger and somewhat more complex. Um, we're not just exposing APIs to what is around the device you're using. We are exposing APIs on what we would consider the world. Hello again. Um, which, for instance, in our mapping activities is exposing APIs on what is in the physical world. We are working a lot on APIs around different forms of data and increasingly richer form of data. Developing also APIs in terms of new forms of interaction, be that interaction which are what we call natural user interfaces, voice, gestures, and so on. And increasingly going beyond that also to, to find a way to expose as APIs knowledge that we're actually gaining from the operations of a certain number of our services and Bing being probably the most important of that. To give an example of the kind of things we've been doing in terms of APIs in a new area, it's what we're doing with our data centers. In our data centers, one of the main things we do is run a cloud service that we call Windows Azure. And we are building APIs on top of, well, something that looks like a data center that there. It has around 300,000 servers inside it. And an API on top of that is actually an API that enables you to do things with what is in that data center. Uh, we've been working on this for quite some time, and we now have a complete exposure of APIs that enable you to, through APIs, do whatever you could do in this data center. Creating new machines, creating networks, creating databases, connected environments, creating affinity groups, failure groups, and so on and so on. And actually exposing as APIs in REST format just about anything you could do in a data center from a virtualized perspective. Um, Another thing is, which is also a historical learning we have, is APIs are great, but if you build SDKs, script, shell interfaces, it makes it a lot easier to do it. Uh, and one of the areas we've been working a lot is creating PowerShell environments uh, to access these APIs. And the example I have here is a PowerShell environment for actually managing the access to 
these Azure features. And just show you an example of how you can do this. It's an example of basically inside Windows Azure creating a rather, not that complex, but relatively complex uh, hosting environment where we create four different subnets, virtual networks inside the environment. We set up front ends, we create a directory with Active Directory, create two databases inside the backend, and create a VPN to be able to reconnect back into the backend environment. So in order to do this, um, I have normally, if I can find it again, inside this environment, Basically, I have a shell environment that enables me to take an example of a script that does a few things by calling the APIs in, in this service. So it's a relatively simple script. I create different activities, set up the environment, do the initial call to open up a subscription. It's a paying service, so I have quite a lot of identification, authentication. I create networks, create virtual machines, set them up, connect them together, create a cluster with SQL, and then build this together. And so I just launched this um, and let it run for a slight time. And during, while I do that, I'll just show you another thing that you can do once you have APIs, which is to build easier interfaces. And so on top of the APIs that we have in the Windows Azure platform, we've built a management environment, which calls the same APIs that you'd be using yourself, but show them in a slightly nicer environment. So all of the things I can do with calling APIs, I've got the same things here, of course. And just to show you that things are actually happening, for the moment I have no virtual network here. I have not got a cloud service that's called something API, but it should be coming in a little moment. While this thing is running, just a slight advertising, we saw a very nice API platform as a service solution from Steve in the session before here. We've also got a very nice platform as a service solution to develop web APIs with a hosting environment inside Windows Azure and a web API framework which enables you to manage all of the different processing, routing, modeling activities and exposure in different protocols uh, of an API if you want to build one. Um, so normally it should have more or less executed now in here. If I'm looking down, are we still running in a few things? So we've been starting to create, basically setting up the complete machines inside the service. I'll check whether we've been moving forward or not. Just refreshing the interface. So we've been starting to create, we've got a service which has the Active Directory in there. Normally I should also have the different elements of my network which has now been created. So I've got the different networks set up inside my environment. And all of this is basically infrastructure being provisioned dynamically through the calling of my API and I have my data center features which are accessible and manageable completely in this environment creating the different subnets and so on and so on. So that's one example of the kind of APIs we're developing, providing programmatic access to all of the different features we have inside our cloud platform. Another area we've been working a lot on is trying to create the same kind of commonality around APIs and data that we did historically in, on a PC with protocols and devices connected to it. And so we've launched a, a platform called the Windows Azure Marketplace, which is essentially an environment that enables you to publish data publish uh, standard API environments, put them into an environment, it's a catalog, you've got promotion, and you've got a standard way of connecting to those different services from another area and exploring what are the different features available through a single standard and consistent REST-based API for all of the different data sets. So we've got different things in there. We've got things such as Dun & Bradstreet company data, we've got weather data, we've got a certain number of services, for instance, in France, we've got a uh, La Poste, which has a standard API to get the postal code of an address you propose. So a very large amount of different uh, APIs and data that are accessible through this platform. And with this environment that manages uh, basically authentication, uh, provisioning, and the commerce activities and payments of it. So it's a very easy way actually to publish data 
if you don't want to manage the payments and activities yourself. We're also using this platform ourselves for one very special area, which is a certain number of features we are developing with our search engine, Bing. Um, Bing is interesting from a few areas. Um, there's one very large source of data and content which is very interesting but relatively difficult to use, which is the web. The web as such, it's a lot of data, but very difficult actually to analyze, collect, and get together. So one of the things we've been doing is to use the Bing engine and create an API on top of that, which enables you to leverage the power of Bing, connect to Bing through a standard API, and get structured data back which corresponds to whatever the activities you have. It's slightly different from a basic search engine in that you don't get search results back, you get actually structured data back that you can then use, integrate into an application, integrate into a service, and use this in a structured way as you would. You get access to the complete information in the web using a structured API. But we're also doing other things inside Bing, and which is sort of probably one of the main changes we're going through as a company on our side, which is leveraging the vast amounts of data, and the analytics you can do on top of that data, machine learning techniques to extract information, value, or knowledge from that data in order to develop new services. And so we're exposing a certain number of these services as APIs in the Bing environment. Some of the most interesting of these services, one of which is relatively classic, which is the mapping API, which enables you to integrate calls to mapping, create maps, geocoding activities, integrate 3D maps inside an application or a website by calling the different APIs. Relatively standard, but extremely useful all the same. Some other areas which are slightly newer, it's the, the voice APIs. One of the things we've been working a lot on over the last years is using advanced machine learning techniques to optimize both voice understanding and text-to-speak generation. We're no longer doing this in traditional methods. We're essentially doing it by machine learning on vast amount of information. So it's not a service that will run on your platform. It's something which runs in the Bing environment. It's an API exposed. You will call it either transmitting voice or transmitting text, and then get the translation or the features back. So it's extremely powerful. Uh, you really leverage a cloud service and you get all of these kind of voice API features back to you. Similar kind of activities in a slightly different area, which is uh, OCR, recognizing text, numbers, anything from a photo, and getting that information back as structured data, supporting several different languages in the meantime. Translator, same kind of approach, also delivered as a service. And you have all the power of the cloud behind it. Now, a slightly different area, which goes a bit beyond that also, it's something that is codenamed Saturi, which is what we'd call an entity database or, or entity relationships. Instead of just crawling the web and creating links between different uh, websites, pages, and so on, we're actually working to create a structured vision of what this data is. It's quite close to what you call a semantic web, except that it's not a semantic web through tagging, it's a semantic web through automatic learning. And so we are progressively, by collecting and analyzing data, which is broadly available, creating a complete database of entities, attributes on entities, relationships between entities. It's essentially a view of the world, a view of the world's information, in a structured environment and with basically something which is quite close to meaning. We're already leveraging this for our own activities. For instance, inside Bing now, in, in the latest versions, if you start searching for something which is a place, a person, a thing, a concept, it will in many cases bring you back structured information on that search. Example here, we have an animal, it's a leopard, you've got different search results, but what you have to the right is an extraction of information on what this thing is. Same kind with a person, Abraham Lincoln, a place, Mount Everest. Getting back information in a structured way and connections to other entities that are close to the thing you were looking for. So this is how we use it. But you can also use it in a different way. And we've actually been starting to build APIs to expose this entity database called Saturi as an API that enables you to integrate the same kind of features in whatever you are developing. 
So we've got two uh, APIs that are currently being proposed. One is still in private beta, but it should be coming out soon. The first one is Synonyms API. Very simple. You submit some text, and it will send you back synonyms analyzing something that is close to whatever you sent in. And it can actually be quite powerful. In the examples I'm giving here, you've got one example which is basically coming something which is a uh, product definition, but proposed in the different variations, and it would reconnect that product definition to one single entity and then expose what synonyms of that would be. Same thing for people. If you give the nicknames of a, of a person and that, that nickname is integrated in the entity database, you will get back a structured view of who that entity really is and not just what the nickname is. And of course, once you've got an entity, you can start working on the relationships, you can find people between them. If it's a person, you can find their children, you can find their husband, whatever. And you can start actually working on this information in an extremely st structured and programmatic way. And that is the second activity, which is the Entity API, which really gives you an API access to all of this database of entities available. The kind of things that we are looking forward to is not just exposing this as an API. The interesting thing we're seeing is the kind of applications you will be able to build with that kind of service. Um, some of the first things we've been working on is, quite simply, it's email extensions. Um, we had a very good session on emails uh, just earlier this today, but one of the things we're seeing is when you receive an email, a lot of the data in that email, the text, the messages, will actually refer to entities. And if you can analyze that text, you can understand entities, intent, then you can actually propose additional services around what that email message will be. So it's not that far from advertising, except that you don't just do advertising, you actually connect it to something which has functional meaning. The kind of scenarios we've been working on is somebody gets an email message from one of their friends saying, why don't we go out to the concert the next, uh, tomorrow evening? You can automatically identify tomorrow evening timing, concert, go back to a service that has an exposure of what concerts would be available tomorrow, and then actually propose inside the same application environment a booking solution to actually directly book and propose going out to a concert the day before. And you can do this with just about any kind of different service. As long as you have some information, you can start extracting entities, and once you've got entities, you can connect those entities with functions, features that enable you to do something on top of it. And so you are actually creating task abilities on top of what information you have. And that's really the vision we're seeing in this kind of activity around the Saturday database and the entity APIs that enables you to get knowledge of what is happening in the world and how you can do something about that. And just to close, then, once you have all of those kind of features, or once you've got a cloud platform where you can automatically get the kind of power you need to execute whatever you want to execute, well, you can start imagining some kind of new features and applications that you could probably build. And with that, I'd love to answer questions. Okay, so is anyone has one question? Because I have one. Oh, question? No, okay. Now I have one question. So um, um, the idea, you know, um, from Azure platform for Bing for with other other API that maybe you had internally that you open or maybe the platform you've built especially to support your architecture. So my question is, um, how do you manage either the business part of it or the branding? So how do you choose which platform integrate which APIs? And uh, and so on this part, it's not a, an easy question. And 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 behind that, um, also what it change into the technical architecture? So what was the, the main uh, challenges to face and the main improvements that you've seen since uh, you're at Microsoft? So business side? So it's a, a very broad question. Um, it, it really depends on the kind of service. In, in things such as Windows Azure, it's essentially a way to make it easier to use something which is already monetized through the standard way for a subscription. And so we're not specifically monetizing the APIs as such. And that is the case with just about all of the traditional commercial services that we have, 
we're not monetizing the APIs. The APIs are a way to add additional value to a service on which you already have a subscription. Um, in the other cases, it's slightly more difficult, I'd say. Um, for the moment, things such as the Bing APIs, we are not necessarily today monetizing them a lot. We're experimenting what you can do with them. Uh, the level of usage is not necessarily much higher than the standard Bing platform, so it doesn't really count. We are probably going into an area where we'll be monetizing in the same way as the mapping solution with a free mid-level, and then increasingly payment once you get into a commercial activity with levels of usage and levels of transactions. Um, second question was around more technology and issues. And um, well, One of the transitions we had is we've been working a lot on SOAP APIs, and we had a transition to REST. Well, that took us a little time. But, uh, but let's say that's just a normal technical issue. Um, probably one of the larger issues we have is that we have a volume of APIs which is quite extreme. Um, and so we've been spending a lot of time to actually trying to standardize the way we develop APIs, optimize the APIs, and have some kind of commonality between them and managing versioning of these APIs. Um, it's one thing to change versions on an API when you have a few hundred customers. Once you start getting an enormous amount of customers, it gets increasingly difficult. Uh, the, the other thing we're doing is, um, well, I can't remember somebody this morning was saying that, is essentially internal uses of HPIs should be considered an external customer. And that's a major change we've been having in the way we actually do engineering across our different activities, which is linked not just to APIs, but to the general transition of our business from being just a software company delivering software solutions every three years to being a, let's call it a services company, doing continuous delivery and upgrade of services on a monthly, weekly, daily basis. And so we're working differently on that, actually. And the way we are working on that in exposing APIs and having continuous integration by the different users of the APIs has changed quite a lot in our engineering. But it's a broader question than just APIs. Just a short last question. Microsoft has bought Epiphany, has acquired uh, Epiphany, a management solution. So if you have any clue about that, is this more for external or internal usage or both? So I have a very clear answer to that. I have absolutely no idea. But if I'm right, we'll be integrating it with the Windows Azure platform as a standard service on Windows Azure. And basically, once you deploy an API inside Windows Azure, you'll have automatic management of the APIs. So it should be a great addition to Windows Azure. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for your answers.